All right. Today we wanted to talk to you a little bit about proxy re-encryption. Um, this is an idea that's been around for probably 25 years in cryptographic research. The idea is that um, if you're using a cryptography system and people are encrypting data to you, uh, that you could, say, go on vacation and you could delegate the ability to decrypt your data to a proxy. So that's why, they, why it's called proxy re-encryption. And the idea in it is that uh, it's, you, it's based on public key cryptography. So somebody encrypts to your public key and you want your backup person to be able to decrypt it and you don't want to just give them your private key, which would let them decrypt all of your data forever. Mm. So you can generate something that you can assign to a proxy server that would say, I want this person's key to be able to decrypt my data. And so that, that's proxy re-encryption. We don't particularly like that name for some reasons. Yeah, so proxy re-encryption sounds like you're re-encrypting data, but what you're doing instead is delegating access to another key. So if we try to break this down into a more um, mundane example, you might want to encrypt data to a particular group of people, say the ops group or something like that, and let everyone in that ops group decrypt that data. Then from that ops group, you could delegate to each individual person in ops, um, which would allow you to do things like, you know, handle people leaving, handle people uh, being hired without actually going and changing the encrypted data on disk. Uh, this turns out to be highly useful um, in lots of different types of systems, um, but it's also uh, one of those things where you can um, leverage the groups and the users um, on top of each other to kind of put together super complex things uh, so why don't you tell us uh, something about those systems? Sure. You know, we, uh, we like to call this ability to make that decision about who groups to encrypt to versus who's a member of the group orthogonal access control. And it turns out in, especially in corporate environments, that's mm. a pretty typical thing. If you think about, um, you know, role-based access control is a pretty popular term for that. You want to set out some rules about what groups of people or, or what people with which roles can do what things. And so one of those things is what data you want to access. And if you want to really be careful about and very sure about what that means, you encrypt the data and you make sure that you know who can decrypt it. And that's where this really shines, I think. Um, you can build an application that's dealing with uh, maybe sensitive uh, HR data and Users might be entering the data themselves into this application and the application can decide, well, I'm going to encrypt this data to an HR group. And, um, and then the manager of the HR group gets to decide which, mem who, which users are members of that group. Right. And so yep. if somebody new gets added, they can add them to that group. And, you know, under the hood, that means that we calculate one of these transform keys that says, okay, we can transform data that's encrypted to the group so it's decryptable by this user. And that can happen. And then if that user leaves the group, we just say, oh, they can't, they can't get that transformation done anymore. The next new person, we create a new transformation. So it really allows you to decouple the decision about at a kind of a higher level, which groups or roles can access data with who's a member of a group or role. Right. And the, the interesting thing is that we can tell exactly when that transform key disappeared, when it was created, things like that. So you know exact timings on when those users uh, would be able to get would access. Would be able to. And in fact, we, we know when they, do get, when they do access a piece of data. Part of this process is that we transform things on demand. So when one of these users that's in the HR group says, I want to look at Colt's data. Yeah then we, we calculate that transformation at the time when that request is made and we can keep track of when that happens. So you can go back and look and find out, oh, right. this is when somebody accessed the data for this user. It got transformed from the HR group to this admin and we, we have audit trails for that. So it's not only 
like a really strong guarantee on who can do it, but you get information about when it was done as well. You know, and, and that is a, um, a big leap over what a traditional crypto system, a public key cryptography system can do. And uh, we think there are just a ton of great use cases for it. And I think end, it, it really is great for enabling end-to-end -end encryption where, you know, maybe you're out in your browser, your okay. phone, and you're entering some really sensitive data, medical data, or, you know, something really sensitive, like you're, you're in a site that your spouse shouldn't know that you're visiting and entering some data. You know, you, you can uh, put that data into that application, encrypt it right there, and decide later who can decrypt it. And you don't have to go pull it back into your app and, and say, oh, I, now, you know, maybe it's a password manager. It's like, oh, I've got a password manager and I've got all of these passwords. And now I just said, I'd like my wife to be able to use a bunch yeah. of these passwords instead of going and like pulling every one of them out and finding her key and encrypting it to her so that she can use it or, you know, sharing your key with her. You can use transform cryptography to do that. And then when one of your children gets old enough that you just yeah. said, well, maybe they should be able yeah. to access some of these passwords too. You can do that without starting over and re-encrypting everything. Yep. Yeah.